let me see if this is really recording. Yes, it is. Um, welcome to the introduction to touch to, to GLSL. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I should drink some Club Mate while we're here to wake me up. Um, we are in the intro to GLSL workshop. Thank you very much for all joining. Um, it's pretty packed. If it's getting too warm, let us know. I think we can open up more windows. Um, I'm Marcus. I work with Derivative. And um, yes, I'll give you basically the lowdown of, um, or, well, the basic lowdown of how you can use um, shaders in Touch Designer, be it for simple 2D things or be it for some three-dimensional manipulation of uh, pixels and such. So um, let's get right started by finding Touch Designer and open up Touch Designer. There it is. And we have multiple nodes in Touch Designer that are connected to shaders. One of them being, and we'll start with that. Oh, I meant to mention this. Actually, if uh, many, many people point to the bookofshaders.com as an excellent learning resource to uh, um, once like to uh, browse through and uh, look at simple examples to more and more complex examples when you're trying to uh, wrap your head, head around certain techniques in GLSL. So it's a really good URL to remember and it looks like it's being still completed and there's more examples coming online uh, so and so often. So it's a very good place to um, check. For everybody who just came before I started handing out the, uh, sorry, after I started handing out the USB keys, there is a USB, three USB keys going around. And if you cannot get to this URL because the internet is uh, rather non-existent, then uh, on these USB, USB keys, you will find um, a folder called Simple Particle System. And please copy that. We'll not need it right away. So, um, just whenever the USB just, key comes across so it, here. It's not forum LAN, it's forum W LAN. Forum U LAN. Oh. Yes. No, no all, is, no, in, no. all is in little, yes. LAN. LAN also, yes. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so once you have Touch Designer open like this, um, <coughs> let's have a look at what we have for GLSL operators. One of the things actually where you can already find uh, pre-made GLSL things is if you're checking through some of the image filters um, in the palette. So on the left side, when you open up Touch Designer by default, you have a palette that opens up and there you find the image filters component and just even uh, dragging in the Cartesian to Polar component, which is the first one, it's a very non... Uh, doesn't do much, right? It's basically converting uh, the texture coordinate system from a Cartesian to a polar system. And you can see that this is done with a GLSL uh, top. And a GLSL top, because you're, you are in the top world, in the texture operator world, means that all the operations done on here are on the pixel shader side, uh, while you can address a vertex shader here. I think you literally just have one polygon that you're drawing on. I actually never used the vertex shader on this, uh, just the pixel shader. Anyway, a little example where you can find some like this. So um, let's put down a GLSL top. And for that, open up the upgrade dialog. And um, how many people of you actually are not novices, like not total novices in touch designer. So everybody, but everybody knows how to place uh, an operator, how to find the, yeah. If you want me to, uh, if, uh, if you need help with things that I might jump over or just assume that everybody knows, uh, please let us know. Um, we'll be happy to explain. So, um, 
when you open up the upgrade dialog, you find in the top family, you will find uh, two nodes relevant to GLSL, which is the GLSL top and the GLSL multi top. So let's start by putting down the GLSL top. The whole thing comes with um, an, a dot attached to it, and it gives you a starting point to uh, uh, how a shader works or what you can do inside a shader. Um, currently, you see that the output is a nice white square, uh, so it's not doing anything. But if you explore the dot a little bit, you can see that there's something here, out, vec, for, frag, color, and then so there's some definition of a four item vector that's called frag color. And then there's something that looks like a loop or a function. It's a function, um, the main function here, where a new color variable that has four, that has a size of four, like a four uh, item vector, is being assigned with something with a number, 1.0. And if I change this here to 0 0.5, the thing that you would expect that happens happens it turns gray. And this whole thing, this color here, is then assigned to what was earlier defined as an out, like an out, but it's what it's writing to essentially, um, frag color. And then it uses this TD outputs whistle. And uh, just, <coughs> just take it as what it is, the TD outputs whistle for now. We'll look at that a little bit later. <laughs> Um, and yes. Um, it's a vec four, yeah, because color would be uh, would be expressed as an RGB a um, value. Correct. Yes. So in the vec four equals four point zero point five. You only have one value. No, because so that's the next step here. What you can do in, um, in GLSL is, is the way how you can assign values to uh, variables. And while we here declared a color variable that's of the VEC4 type, a vector with four um, items, then what you can do now, you have access to each of these items by what they call swizzles. So you can type color dot and then you could control, for example, R. And you can say R is 0 0.9. And then never forget the semicolon. And you get a beautiful flesh color. Skin color, not flesh. Maybe, ah, who knows. Um, and you can do this with all these visual types. So we also have color dot G, for example, and you could say 0 0.2 and make that more pink. And color dot B, which you could assign to 1.0. Don't forget the semicolon. And so you see we are changing, we keep changing the color. And last but not least, with a color dot A set to uh, uh, 0 0.2, um, the alpha has changed. But I have to do this because I have my preferences. I'm not sure the preferences when you open Touch Designer by default come as a checkerboard background for the alpha. And I always have this as black, but I'm going to change that to checkerboard. And you see basically now this color.a is controlling the alpha. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. Yes, of course. Edit references. Dip, 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 dip. Take size. No. 
I never did that before. Well, you, when you zoom out, it stays the same size. Ah. Right, I can. No, that is all 15, right? Marcus, can you edit it? Because when it's placed, you can say. Let me just also fix that. Edit content. There we go. View. And dum -dum -dum. since it will be mainly for now, I'll try to do it like this. So these whistles, there's a, there's a multiple of these whistles are available. You have RGBA for, um, and they can be used interchangeably. Like you don't have, it doesn't mean that if you say color.r that you have to define, um, color.r basically means it's the first part of the VEC4. So I could also say color.x and set that to 0 0.1 and now it's affecting the first part of the the color vector so those uh, swizzles that are available are totally up to you to use in which way you would like they are um, they're more for you to also know what you're actually what you're actually adjusting so we have dot r dot g dot b dot a dot x dot y dot z dot w and dot s dot t dot u no not dot u i actually don't know you have u v s t yeah oh u v s t okay thank you obviously i never use those <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with, with, I'm sticking with those, but that's perfect. Um, another way to to uh, I showed you how you can address one single, or we we looked at how to address the whole vector by one by one value here. Uh, we addressed single parts of the vector, but you also can do things like color dot rg equals vec2 because now I'm only talking to two parts of it 0 0.2 comma 0 0.5 control s and you have uh, control over two parts and you also can do square brackets I believe Yes. It is literally it's literally the way that you wanna name them so you know what you're actually what what you're doing. What spaces does it deal with? Like does, is it is it zero to one color or is it Right. So uh, by default the uh, um, if you look at texture operators in Touch Designer then on the comment page you have an option or you have a menu entry called pixel format and the pixel format pretty much defines or uh, sets the value range that you have that you can um, if you have an 8-bit if you have an 8-bit which is by default an 8-bit color value then uh, you cannot go outside the range of 0 to 1 but if you increase that then you can go um, outside of that range as well but in general you will have if you're just dealing with pixels and you're using the pixels to look at things then your value range is 0, 0.0 to 1 if you're starting to use which is totally um, which is a use of shaders if you start to use pixels to store information or whatever you can store in there whatever values you like 
setting the right uh, pixel format. Um, so what happens when you forget one of these semicolons or you do something else that's illegal? Uh, touch shows this uh, blue red checkerboard here and alerts you to, an, to a, a compile error and it tells you to use the info dot to see details. So it's usually a good idea actually to put down an info dot because yes and the info dot has a operator parameter and you drag the GLSL node into it onto the operator parameter and now you can see okay the pixel shader reports an error syntax error unexpected identifier blah 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 on line 18 and you can basically now well you basically have to work back and try to see uh, you have a you have an error that shows up on line 18 as an invalid identifier but the last uh, what was actually happening because of the semicolon missing here it tries to go further in the uh, shader and alerts you to this error. So the info dot is really a very useful thing to have uh, connected to a GLSL top at all times or to a GLSL material at all times to um, see what, what errors are happening there. So, sorry? The, oh, passive on, um, that is if, if values in, because you can attach any kind of uh, operator onto the info uh, dot, and if, if you're attaching operators that uh, if, uh, cook every frame, that are force cooking every frame, then the passive, I believe, uh, on only updates the info dot when you look at it, and I'm looking at Jared. Yeah, it only updates when, um, when something else demands it to cook. To cook, yeah. Because, because otherwise, if it's, if, it's, if it's off, then it will actually, if you're looking at the viewer, just the act of looking at the info shop will cause the viewer to cook. I see. Uh, is it similar to the selective group? Uh, yes, it's similar. Yeah. Uh, my sublime doesn't color. Uh, uh, um, yes, you have yeah. the you know, so. It's just a language in sublime text or in Atom. Yes. Um, to, 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 it's a package. Yeah. You can see if it's already installed or if you have to download it with the uh, package uh, control. I'm not sure, on Windows it's Control shift p how to get there. But. Yeah, most... You have not the special... Uh, you don't have the special label. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, the video which you are now recording is going to be online yes yeah that will be all posted eventually so um, one more thing about defining uh, values here because it's just all these combinations of swizzles and uh, whatnot you can also do things like this color R uh, yes RG equals now let's do this float red so I'm defining a single valued float here. Uh, float red is 0 0.8. And now I could say color RG is vec2 because I'm describing, uh, I'm setting two values on this color vector. And now I could say red and some other value 0 0.1. So inside of these uh, vector descriptions, you can also then use other variables that you defined earlier. Could you explain the difference between red color and color? Maybe? 
So the uh, oh frac color and color. So okay, the uh, the frac color is uh, is a definition that's um, what you can do in touch is you can um, you basically tell it to write to an output buffer. So you can you can tell it okay take this pixel shader and then output um, output what the output of the pixel shader is or your calculation to the screen or to some other buffer that you're defining and we'll get to this in a bit and um, to define all these output buffers you can write out the for output and then vec4 which would be because it's an RGB a uh, color buffer and then a name and frac color is just the name that I've given this uh, thing. What I can do here is I could literally say uh, my output and now rename this to my output and I have the same thing. So it's basically a definition of uh, an output name essentially. The, the buffers will be named. Yes. Is It's by buffers because you can have uh, many buffers that you can address and um, it becomes important that you name them properly so that you know where you're writing to. Um, I'll get to the buffers in a bit uh, because, yeah, I'll show you how that works in a second. Um, the next step, the next thing that is already in a shader when you um, just put down a GLSL is this vec4 here, and I'm just gonna comment out. You see commenting out lines is by two slashes. And the next part that is here is the, uh, that comes in the shader by default, is something where the color is defined by a texture call. So it's a texture which calls a texture, that's a, a GLSL function, and then there is this std2d input zero, which is how you describe std2d inputs is an array with all the inputs to the operator, to the GLSL top, and then zero or one or two uh, de um, defines which input you're picking. And then after that comes vuv.st, vuv being the um, the uh, texture coordinates and this is basically the pixel that you're operating on and uh, this is already defined inside touch you don't have to define that anywhere so what this texture call does is it looks at the first input and then picks a pixel at a position that it's currently operating on assigns that to the vec4 color that is defined that's being defined here and then it's being output at the end. So you can try that. To try that would be um, adding a movie file in top. And you can plug that into the first input of the GLSL top. And now by taking these two slashes out, you get a banana. Here somebody asked what to the outputs was on. Sorry? Oh yeah, that was the question before and I didn't uh, answer that yet because of the um, I didn't go to buffers yet, okay. but then we actually did explain more about already because the question came up again with frag color. Oh, yeah. But that is, uh, yeah. But you know, you know what it is? It's assigning it to the, uh, to the out whistle that you defined. Yeah. That was it. What, it, what it's doing is it's because Macs don't have alpha only textures. Internally, I use a red only texture, so if you give me an alpha value, I need to move it up to the red before it outputs. Oh, it's a neat story. 
Okay. Yeah. There's no like monochrome out of the room. Text on back. So I need to red green text. Sorry. So you know I mean move the channels red. Okay. You're reordering to what the actual operating system allows. So, and you need to define that only because when you're working on both systems. That way it's important. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to explain that? Uh, people are interested in that, yeah. Yeah, okay. I have some uh, better information to the TD output swizzle, a function that I generally just put down, but uh, Malcolm's going to give you uh, a short, closer uh, explanation to that. Uh, yes, so basically you just always want to have, whenever you output a color in from any of our shaders, both in the materials and in the tops, you always want to output it through that function. And the reason is, is because uh, Mac and Windows stores their textures differently. For example, on Mac there's no such thing as an alpha-only texture. So internally I need to store as a red-only texture. So this essentially just takes the value that you've written to your alpha and then moves it over to the red channel on Mac. Um, so essentially it just allows your shaders to be portable between Mac and Windows. They'll work the same on both of them, um, regardless, despite their differences in the way they use OpenGL. So really. You just, just always use it, really, is in the end, is all you need to do. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, back to the textures. Uh, we have one input here. And just to show you the second input, and I think you can repeat that for yourselves quite well, uh, copy and paste the movie file in and um, pick a different image or um, sample image and plug it into the second input. And now you can define a second color back for color two is texture. And now the STD 2D inputs one comma VUV dot ST and the semicolon. So now I have a second color here and I can do something with those two colors. Uh, I could, for example, now say um, color equals, I think actually that works too, color two. So I'm, subtra I'm subtracting the second texture from the first texture here. And what I get is a banana with a sky subtracted from it. So basically, you can get to multiple textures that you're inputting. And then you can combine them or uh, manipulate them in any way. One thing, and uh, Priam, you asked that earlier, actually, was that um, one use of GLSL textures or GLSL materials um, GLSL tops specifically can be if you're running systems that um, where you're running into problems with top chains. You have lots of tops that are um, taking up too much uh, cycles on your GPU or too much memory. Um, then sometimes it is advisable to combine them into one shader. And um, that's most often if you take like a level a, comp a composite and a level or something like that. Yeah. And th those are these ways how you, you write your composite function yourself and then say your level function would be color times equals 0 0.4 and you have your own simple level right there. So it makes really sense to do these um, when you're running into trouble with uh, too many um, too much pressure on your GPU. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, if the two textures are different um, pixel dimensions, how yeah. is it doing the color subtraction? It's not like a one-to-one -one pixel subtraction. Um, it does. Uh, it would be a one-to-one -one pixel match because it takes the first uh, input as a resolution. And then you have the UV is stepping through the UVs or through the zero to one uh, in each direction of the first texture. So you're not sampling every, you're basically squishing or stretching the second input. 
Yeah. So if you take a little, um, let's just try that right here. If I change the resolution of my second movie file in to um, an eighth, nothing really happens to my output, but uh, the GLSL is still, the GLSL top has still the resolution of the first input and it's sampling with those values. So in this case, you would be uh, um, sampling multiple times in the second uh, texture. Turn off Slack before doing workshops. There we go. Um, all right. Now, uh, now we looked at uh, getting at textures and we looked at the different inputs to it, GLSL top. And we have also this VUV.ST, which is the uh, texture coordinates that we want to look at that we want to sample from the texture. And obviously we can also take this VUV, which is given by us from Touch Designer and uh, change it. So we can make our own VEC2 um, text cord and just say VUV.S, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong. There we go. Um, VUV.ST. Let me spell it like this. And now we could say for the. Uh, um, now we want to offset one of the. Uh, like we want to offset the whole thing in X, for example. So text chord dot. Uh, well, let's take S. Plus equals 0 0.3. And now we're shifting the whole texture a little bit. And now we can use we can use this new texture coordinate that we just made and use it to pick the color, the pixels from the first input, which was our banana. and our banana shifts. Because for the first, for where you or for, um, yeah, for the first pixel, so to say, that it's operating on, it's actually looking 0 0.3 units into the texture, pulls the pixel from there and places it um, on its currently operating pixel. Um, da -dum. Okay. Similarly, you can also stretch. Uh, you can also stretch these coordinates. So, if you want to do scaling in a shader, then by multiplying the texture coordinates with a certain uh, value, you can squish the image together or scale it up, but that's probably there. Scaling the whole thing. Now the scaling happens from the first, like from the left side, because that's the origin of your coordinate system there. Okay. Um, now we've already talked about all these different buffers that we can output to, but we never have done it actually. So let's have a look at the GLSL top. And um, oh, sorry, no, we should do something else before. Sorry, um, where does it get the UVs from? The UVs are passed in by Touch Designer itself. So that's you're just getting that. It basically. You, is a um, but yes, like screen space UV. it's screen space UV yeah so like UV it. literally from the bottom left corner yeah. in zero one zero one 
but if you have a different UV mapping yeah. in your object, it's a UV mapping of your object. It's not directly zero to one. If you change, if you have a mapping before on your mesh, it's sys map sys UV. It's not right. It's not me by uh, Tau Designer. Is Tau Designer, if you have not UV mapping, is exactly that. If you have a special UV mapping, you use a UV mapping of your mesh. Yeah, that's correct. And this is, um, so uh, in the, uh, so there's a difference between the, uh, the GLSL top and the GLSL material, where in the GLSL top, it's given to you. And in the material, then you actually have to uh, get it from the texture uh, coordinates itself. I heard something like a plug or something. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is it? Is it? Does it have power? It's coming back on. It says vamp temperature. Uh oh. I heard a. I, uh, okay. Okay. So there was a reason for it. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully we didn't pop the bulb. <laughs> we can maybe. Uh, so the front color is like one of the offers that you said. That was the first one that I defined yeah. as an output. Yeah. Oh, I see. I'll find out. Um, yeah, let's have a look while the projector is... Oh, the projector is coming back by itself. That's good. Uh, if, you're, if you're having a look um, on the parameters of the GLSL top itself, then on the first page, the GLSL page, it has a number of color buffers at the... Uh, and... Yes, excellent. Um, At the bottom of the GLSL parameter page, you have a number of color buffers. And let's just do that right away. We have, uh, it's set to one by default. So let's output uh, two color buffers here. And previously we changed already that name here. The default name was frag color and I changed it to my output. But I can just define another one here. Out back for, um, my other output. And then further down, I can just assign to my other output another color. And I'll do the TD outputs visual function as well. And then I'll just um, assign to my second color buffer, I will just assign the color to. Um, so the second input that I had there. So. Now nothing changed on the output of the GLSL itself because the GLSL top itself is only, it's only possible to look at one color buffer um, at a time. But we do have these, um, um, we do have these render select tops. And when you put down render select, it doesn't just take render tops, but it also takes um, GLSL tops, any top basically that allows you to write to multiple buffers. And so let's drag the GLSL top onto the top parameter of the render select one. And the color buffer index parameter of the render select has by default uh, one. But now you can switch between the two color buffers. Zero was the, is the output of my GLSL where I do the color manipulation and the texture coordinate ma manipulation. And the output buffer one was just uh, the second input. How many buffers do you have? Is there... I there's have today only supported. Why do you need to Well, there's all kinds 
If you want to look at a, a good example for lots of color buffers and where you need this, and we're getting to this uh, later in the workshop, um, under tools, you can find a component that's called um, particles GPU. And when you drag the particles GPU in and look inside the component itself, then um, and we'll get to this later, but this is really a good example for it. The, uh, the, um, the GLSL top that uh, calculates the particle position cannot or does not only have to calculate the particle position, but it has to store much more information than this. It has to store uh, rotation of the particles. It has to store uh, life, how old those particles are. And you only have four color channels, though, per buffer. So all this information you need to store in more buffers, which are then, um, like here's a velocity, which it's hard to see. Let me find something. Well, unless you normalize into a color, I guess they will be difficult to visualize. So here we have, for example, the position for all these particles uh, stored in a separate color buffer. Uh, and yeah, life doesn't look too exciting, but you see it kind of the red dots going away there. So that's a perfect example for color buffers where you actually need them, where they don't, where, where they're not optional anymore. Um, okay. Marcus, can I mention it's probably better to be using an array for your outputs. Is it? Uh, Oh, if you go in order, not even in order, it guarantees it. I don't know if that's implied by the language. It's possible different drivers can be different. Okay. You can also use the layout qualifier. So, in this case, what you want to do is you would define those as um, by one name, like frag color, which is the default, and then assign it a array size. So, if you want to have, uh, well, we just have. Um, two color buffers. No? Yeah, that's right. You your Oh, oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And then to output to those, and I should be doing this in here so everybody can see it. Frag color zero. So you have array access to that and frag color one. And we're back. So that's a good point. I really like naming them, but I guess I've just been lucky because I'm running on my computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have it here somewhere, but I can type it out. Yep. This would be out. Oh, it's in the right. We can also find that on the help page here. Nope, we don't have internet. Do you have it in your? Yeah, obviously. So it's Like four and the name uh, third out. <coughs> Output swizzle. Um, Uh, 
let's just give it a default number or like a gray. Okay, and increase the color buffer to three and we have gray on the third output. Okay, yes, so definitely, yeah. If you want to name them, then we need this uh, layout qualifier in the, on, at the start. Reference the outside of the mode or just the um, You only can, <coughs> when it comes to textures, um, you only can reference um, what's, what comes via the inputs. Um, but how do you get information into the shader? Uh, one of the things, for example, that you might want to do is I have been typing in all these values here. But those values are usually things that you want to control from the outside. They're not fixed. And this is when we want to start uh, defining uniforms. So if we want to have control over this uh, scaling factor that I have defined here, we can define outside of the main loop a uniform. So we'll type uniform and we'll make it a float because it's just a single value <coughs> and we'll call it scale x and instead of the 0 0.7 I'll use scale x here save it and now we need to define this exact uh, uniform that we defined in the shader we also have to um, create it on the node itself. And that's what these vector pages are for. So on the vector one page, if we type scale X, comes right away back because the default value is 0 0.5. And now you can control this uh, scaling factor from the node itself. So now exporting onto it with an LFO chop or um, if you need if you need to bring those things inside. And these uniforms can be, um, as you see here, all these uniform names have, or all these uniform values have again um, up to four characters or up to four items here. And therefore you can define uniforms that are of the type VEC4 as well, or VEC2 or whatever you need. So in fact, if I don't want to just scale in X, but I also want to scale in Y, then let's rename this to scale and I'll make this a VEC2 scale and I'll be transforming um, all of my texture coordinates here with the scale parameter then now you have control over um, the X scale, the horizontal scale via the LFO. And I just going to turn that off, zoom in a little bit and Y scale with your second uh, value here. So you can use this to define or to bring in colors or any other uh, values to control um, your shader. <coughs> Any questions on this? Nope. Okay. One thing that's really nice to do in Touch Designer, and I'm not sure if you all uh, know about this, sometimes you make little examples and you want to package them up and just, um, yeah, have them in a component itself. 
you don't have to copy and paste into another component. You can select all the nodes that you um, that you want to have inside a component, and then right click onto a pane and say uh, collapse selected, which is pretty low down in the menu. Here, it collapses it, and you can call it 2D. GLSL examples. All right. And I'm going to close this. And the next step will be looking a little bit at um, the GLSL material. So to use a GLSL material, what we would need is um, well, we need a scene, a, three, a 3D scene to uh, render out. And the easiest to do is probably let's create a box. So open up the create dialog and find a box up. Now, usually what I do to set up a render scene, um, you need a geometry component. So what I do is right click on the output of the box up and get the geometry component here. And we need a camera. And we need often a light. So we'll get a light here. Although let's skip the light. Let's just take a render top. And sorry, there's a there's a geo component. And the last thing we need is a material. And in this case, we'll take a GLSL material. So in the upgrade dialog, <coughs> go onto the material page and find the GLSL material. <coughs> and let's reference the, uh, when you put down a material other than a fong, um, <coughs> no, always, we need to reference the material on the geometry component itself. So click on the geometry component, go in the parameters to the render page, and then drag the GLSL material onto the material parameter there. Even though it has an error. And we can check what the error is. We don't have a, we don't have a vertex or pixel shader defined. Um, so to start with a vertex and pixel shader, let's put down two text dots. text and we'll call this the vertex shader and another text that which will be our pixel shader and we'll reference those two shaders in the um, in the pr appropriate parameters in the GLSL mat so when selecting the GLSL mat on the load page you find the vertex shader parameter so we'll drag the vertex dot into it and you find the pixel <coughs> shader parameter so we'll drag that into this as well okay So we need these two elements. One is the vertex shader, which basically acts on each vertex of your incoming geometry. And you use what you do in it is you describe how this vertex is brought from the uh, um, uh, object space to the um, camera space so that you can display it through the camera in your render top. 
and screen space. screen space. Yes, thank you. And the uh, um, a very simple vertex shader, or all what you need for it basically for the simplest one, is similar to what we had previously in the pixel shader in the GLSL top. We'll need the um, main function. And then we'll use a call, which is gl underscore position. And this, one's, uh, this basically wants all the uh, vertex positions taken from the world space into the screen space, projection space. Sorry? Oh, it's right. Uh, Old GR. <laughs> There's no old GR. <laughs> Sorry, when, when you yeah, convert the coordinates into uh, screen space, what happens with the, the third coordinate? Sorry? For what, did you yeah. say that you convert the world space coordinates or object space into screen space? Yeah. yeah. Is it just a projection? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Then. <laughs> with a pre-given function td world to projection and then inside here we'll take a td deform function and inside that we'll take P and let's take that a little bit apart so the TD world to projection is um, a function a touch designer shader function which uh, converts from world to projection space the TD deform function will take your uh, vertex position attribute which is P which comes in by default and do any deforms on it that are through um, bones and instancing. Um, there's, if you go to the page, uh, if you go to the uh, page how to write a GLSL material, it lists the, it lists pretty much the single parts as well because you also give the single parts that the TDD form does if you, if you need them, right? Yeah. Generally, you just throw the TDD form and it takes care of it. Of it, correct. Is P a three-dimensional vector? Yes. Yes. And the other thing that TDD form does is it also converts your soft space positions to the world space. And with that given, we can also write a very simple pixel shader. And we'll start again with the outvec4 frac color from previously. And we'll need our uh, main loop and we'll need to define the output color and we'll give it a constant color Let's, uh, 
color. And I'm slightly confused <coughs> why I don't see this as a white box. Is there any good boxes? Sorry? Is there two boxes? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I probably should have started with deleting the default network here because the render top uh, picks up, the render top by default picks up all the, all the geometry as the geometry parameter has a star in it, so. Okay, so we're rendering a white box here. Now, um, let's go back to the vertex shader and let's see what we can do with the vertex shader. And for example, what we can do with these positional attributes that are coming in by default, which is this P. We could describe our, um, we could get our positions or take the positions and write them into a custom uh, variable. So let's say we'll take a vec3, my position equals P, Um, yeah. I, well, I have my Info, yeah. That's probably a good idea to put down again. As I showed you before, yeah. Have the info dot always connected to your uh, to your shader so that you can debug if there's errors. But you're guessing the obvious here. Um, with taking these positional attributes and writing them to our own um, variable, vector3 variable, we have the chance now to actually transform the position of each vertex. So taking my pos and the, um, the x coordinate of it and setting it to a specific value or actually adding to it zero plus equals 0 0.3 we're moving the box my position dot y plus equals 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 you're moving the box up Describing this as a uniform, as we did previously, where we can then use outside parameters to control these values here. We can define uniforms in the uh, vertex uh, shader as well. By typing uniform, um, we'll take a vec2 for xy, 
and call it translate. Or we could also, let's make it a VEC3 because we'll just be able to translate it into all three directions. And then say my pass plus equals translate. And now on the, sem on the uh, vectors page of the uh, uh, GLSL mat, we can define that uniform, call it translate. And because by default the values are 111, um, it shifts the box up into the, to the right-hand corner, but we can move it now via these parameters around. Perhaps even again, uh, use an LFO chop and in an LFO chop you can define multiple channels at once on the channel page via the channel name so T square bracket XYZ will give you um, three channels here and we can export that onto the uh, uh, translate uniform that we defined. <clears throat> I'm just gonna offset the face here a little, which uh, with an expression, which is me dot... <coughs> Sorry? Um, you can create three channels on the channel page by saying uh, T open square bracket X, Y, Z, or you can type it out. I mean, you don't really save that much here. T, X, T, Y, T, Z. And then we can create an offset or the phase offset by typing um, something like 0 0.1 times me dot chan index. And you basically offset each channel by the phase 0 0.1 depending on the channel number times the channel number. Now the next thing that you can do in, um, in shaders, especially if you use the GLSL material is you probably want to put some kind of texture onto the geometry, an outside image that you plop onto the geometry itself. And for that, you need texture coordinates. Now, um, most, geom most geometries that are generated in touch, you can define the texture coordinate as it, um, that it's created with. And you can also double check when you middle mouse click onto an operator, onto a SOP, then it tells you what kind of attributes are attached to that um, operator. So here you can see we have a point attribute N, which is the normals. And we have a vertex attribute UV, which is the textures. Middle mouse click on the box. Yes. How did you connect the, the null to the GLSF? Um, the null. Oh, this one. Sorry, yes, so uh, this is called uh, exporting. So uh, to export values from channels onto parameters, you select the operator that you wanna, where you want to control the values. So in my case, that's the uh, GLSL material. And you go to the page where those values are. And then on the, uh, on the chop here, click the active flag your active flag, which is the right corner. So the whole border disappears of that node. And now when you roll over a channel, it turns green. And now you can take this channel, drag it onto the value that you want to export it to and let go. And a little menu pops up where you choose export shop. And you can do this with all three. To this. 
Now to add a texture onto this cube, we first need to uh, have that image. So let's put down a movie file in top. Yeah. Um, yes, so we do have, uh, for the external editor, yeah, it depends on how it's being opened. And we do have in the, uh, um, in the text that there's, a, there's an option here where you can say edit view extension. And by default, that says from language, which would be Python or T-Script. Yeah. Uh, but you can select which language it actually should, should be. So what I did, I didn't set that. I just uh, set the uh, um, coloring in, my, in the editor yeah. to it. But you can, if you pick uh, GLSL here for these two, mm -hmm. then they always will open up as uh, GLSL and be recognized as a... Um, so that's on the common page, um, edit view extension, GLSL. Um, excuse me? Yeah. Um, exists a list of uh, reserved words uh, of GLSL Fashion Designer? Of GLSL, um, there's the list of uh, functions on the... Uh, For example, did you work in to project, did a form with an, uh, the yeah. meanings? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a long wiki page that explains it. It's not a, just a list; it's an article, yes. so it goes through all of the uh, okay. all of the sections. Atomics. But it, yeah. Okay. It's yeah. A, it's out no, no, no. I, I, uh, I do. I can only understand if it's a, it's a, uh, only a list of uh, those are the words because sometimes it's uh, faster to right. understand what is the function that exists and what is not. Yeah, it's it's a it's an article, okay. which okay. basically has all the yeah. explanations yeah. on but it. In Atomium, there is a package where you have the reserved GLSL works. Right. Yeah, yes. that would be then the. Yeah. Uh, I don't know for Sublime Text, but for Atom, you can have it. Yeah, uh, I don't know for Sublime either. Um, um, all right. Does everybody have a movie file in top? So let's pick an image that's not the banana, maybe. And what we need to do here is we need to A, read in the texture. And we did that previously in the pixel shader. We'll probably do that again in the pixel shader now. But in the, uh, um, when we used the GLSL top, we were given the texture coordinates by Touch Designer, view VST. Now we have to get them from the, or we have to take them from the geometry and move them to the, um, to the pixel shader stage. So first let's get this image here that I have on my movie file in and attach it so that we can access it in the GLSL mat. And this can be done on the samplers page. So if you click on uh, samplers one, you can give this sampler a name. And let's call this, um, I don't know, I'll call it a photo. And reference the operator. Just gonna attach a null here for prettiness. <coughs> What this means now is giving a sampler name that means that inside our shader code this, um, this texture will be known under photo. Not under the top name, but under this name that we have given it here. <coughs> and now in the pixel shader, we can already get to the, uh, uh, we can already define our uh, incoming sampler. And we'll do this by typing uniform. And then this is a sampler 2D. And then the name, photo.
but again, what's missing here is now previously we had VUV. We need to get from the vertex shader stage, we need to move this into the pixel sh uh, shader stage. So in the vertex shader, let's define the texture coordinates. So we'll, um, yeah. To send those over to the pixel shader, we'll have to type out. And then that's a vector two for the uh, texture coordinates. Okay. And now we have to define what these text chords are. So inside the main loop, we'll write text chords equals UV. And this is given to us by Touch Designer. And that's an array because you can have multiple texture coordinates on an object. So there's the first one dot ST. So we're sending text chords out. And now on the pixel shader side, we need to receive it. So go to your pixel shader. And in the pixel shader type in vec2 text chords, I think I called it. And now we can do what we did before. We can take, we can um, describe the out color or assign to the out color the uh, color values that are picked from the texture photo, from the sampler to the photo. So. We'll type out color in the pixel shader equals texture was the call to get uh, access to the texture. Photo is the name of the sampler 2D and then text chords. Is texture a GLSL function or is it Texture is the GLSL function. So what we did here is essentially um, build a very simple shader that takes the geometry and um, assigns a material to it. The vertex shader, yeah. And I'll package that up again into a component here. Uh, collapse selected. And call that a uh, match GLSL example. So um, the reason for GLSL, uh, why, I mean, it's the processing of GLSL is essentially much faster, obviously, on the GPU than doing a lot of the um, calls on the CPU. And therefore, things that can be done is uh, if you have to do operations on a huge amount of points, for example, and you want to do, you want to offset uh, points, then you don't necessarily want to do that on a sub level, but you want to do this on the graphic cards level. A good example for that would be let's place down a grid, a grid sub. Sorry? Oh, okay. 
Um, it's, the dots connected to the GLSL it's going in the stages of the of how the um, in the shader stages so first you have the vertex shader stage and this is then going into the pixel shader stage in between there you have the geometry shader but um, if you only have the vertex and pixel then the out will send it to the pixel and then the out on the pixel sends it to the buffer. So their sequence is important then. Because if you, if, you, if you have an out on the pixel shader, you can't from the, you have to say in on the vertex shader. That doesn't work exactly because it does first the vertex and then the pixel shader. Yeah. This is only shared within the pipeline of a certain GLSL material. GLSL yeah. Yeah. No, not outside there. That's correct too. So, so what is if you let's take for example a grid sop, and let's try to offset this grid sop by a noise top. Oh, sure. I mean, I can. Uh, this is basically an example that you don't need to work with because we'll be replacing it with a GLSL. So maybe I'll just move on here. Um, we have a grid, and we want to move the points of the grid in the z direction by the values taken from a, a noise top. And a way to do this would be uh, a pure node way would be to um, convert the grid into a um, into a chop. So we'll take a sub two chop, dip, 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 get this, and now we want to convert the noise into a chop as well. So we get the colors. So we'll take a top two chop and reference the uh, noise on it. And now the first input to the top two uh, chop is uh, UV uh, sample values, and we can use the the grid here we have to manipulate it a little bit because uv sampling values are always between zero and one while the grid has its center at uh, zero itself so we'll take a math here and just offset that by 0 0.5 but again you don't need to um, do this with me and now i've got all my noise values here and we just need r because it's a monochrome noise and we'll use the R to um, with a chop to sub to offset the values in Z. Sorry. No. Okay. And we can compute normals here as well. That's great. So, yes, that's basically the regular workflow. Um, now, this is all fine and dandy if you have uh, a low amount of points or um, you just have a static uh, image. But if you start animating, um, if you start animating the whole thing, then pretty quickly, depending on the number of points that you're acting on here, uh, you will see that your frame rate starts dropping. I'm pretty impressed, actually, how long that takes here. <laughs> Who needs shaders? <laughs> 50 frames per second, nobody realizes. Anyway, so you have this, eventually you will hit, hit uh, performance issues here. Because maybe you want to do something else than just that. Um, so we already did parts of this because we used, um, we created this shader where we offset the box vertexes by um, some values that we were exporting onto it. So we can recreate this whole thing in a simple shader network. And I'll just delete all this. Now I'll keep the noise here. Okay. 
delete this, we donate the chop too. And instead, I'm going to set up a little render network as we did before. So I right click on the output of the grid sub and find a geometry component and add a new camera. Just in case you didn't do that before, I did package the previous example with the material into its own component uh, so that it doesn't, so we don't get uh, confusing. Uh, not multiple cameras and the render picks up only one geometry, etc. Okay, so I'll create a render top here as well. And this time I'll also create a light. And I'll create a Fong mat. Because what we'll do is we'll use the Fong mat as a starting point for this example here. So the phone needs to be referenced in the, by the geometry. On the render page, you find the material parameter, so drag the phone onto there. And now what you can do is, with the phone here, the phone has a little pulse button here where it says output shader. So this can create pre a prepared phone shader for you. When you hit this output, it creates a Fong 1 GLSL and a vertex and a pixel shader. And the vertex and pixel shader, as they are, are exactly what the Fong shader would be. Um, I just use the default that is selected there and click OK. You can do two-sided if you, it's not necessary. I think we'll just look at it from the front. Doesn't matter for our example. Yeah? Um, so all I did was I placed the phone and I referenced it to the geometry material. And then what it, um, if you click on the phone and bring up the parameters, on the first page right at the bottom it says output shader. And when you click that, just use the defaults here, click OK, and it creates the uh, Phone 1 GLSL. And now we can reference the Phone 1 GLSL that was just created on the material page of the geometry component. Nothing changes as it's exactly the same so far. And I'll delete the Phone 1. So the next thing that we want to do is we'll take the noise here and we'll use the noise values to offset each vertex. So first thing that we need to do is reference the noise as a sampler on the GLSL material. So on the samplers one page, we'll call the sampler offset and plug in the null or the noise. And I just have to use the one. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Sorry about that. Um, what we did previously here was that we defined the uh, we defined the sampler, and then we used the sampler in the pixel shader to uh, um, attach it onto this cube. But what we would want to do now is we want to bring in this um, sampler, this noise, into the vertex shader and offset um, the uh, uh, Z, offset it in Z. So let's edit the vertex shader, right click on it and say edit. Um, and I'll shrink that together again. And it's probably a good point also um, in the class here to look at what actually this um, output shaders created here. We have a bunch of uniforms that uh, correlate with the uh, color uh, parameters that we have in the Fong mat by default. So those are all in here. And you have something called an out vertex. It's, uh, it's, it's a struct, structure exactly, where you can pass multiple variables as one structure over to the next shader stage, which is the pixel shader here in our case. Flat int. Now, this is something you have to send integers as flats, and I actually don't know why. Cut, cut the range of uh, the integer, taking only the, plus, uh, the positive value. Oh, that's no, the... So I don't remember what. No, huh? So, by default, uh, the things that you send from the vertex shader Would you, would you just get illegal values when you do just int? I'm pretty sure it'll give you an error. In error, okay. Yeah. Why didn't camera index have an error? Why didn't camera index for the vertex? Um, it's, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily need it right away here. It's just because we created it from a phone. Oh yeah, because the phone cares about yeah. the incident angle. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so it gives you an error. You have to define an int that you sent over as a flat int. Um, and further down, the first thing that's happening here then, it says first deform the vertex in normal and then return the values in, um, in world space and this is being given to the GL position. So what we want to do is we again want to monkey around with this uh, positional attribute here. So first let's get in the image, the sampler. So we'll have to define another uniform here. Uniform uh, I'm blanking, I'm sorry. Sampler to D. Yeah. And we called it offset.
and now we can fetch this um, we can fetch this offset texture in here by defining a, um, well actually we just need one value because it's a, a monochrome texture anyway so we'll take uh, a float offset value or val equals texture and uh, it's called offset comma and then the texture coordinate would be uh, of uv zero dot st and what did I do? Uh, ST is basically the uh, swivels, so you could say uh, it's which part of the um, variable which could be a vector, and then which part of the vector you're pulling out. So previously we had the color vector with the RGBA, and so for any vector you, you have to, or if you want to just have parts of that vector, then you define it by a swivel, and ST would be one of those uh, swivels. Uh, yeah, I can write those out. There are, so we had a uh, swivel R, G, B, A. Then there is X, Y, Z, W. And it's U, V, S, T, right? No, it's a S, T, P, Q. It's S, T, P, Q, okay. S, T. Are these interchangeable? Yes. So these are just components of the vector. Yeah. yeah. You can you literally use them as decorators, yeah. or not decorate, but, but something that makes it legible for you. Um, all right. Let's check the info that. Oh right. Obviously. So what I did here is the info dot gives me the error. Um, implicit narrowing of type vec4 to float. So what did I do in my vertex shader here? I said float offset value, I defined it as a float, but then I'm looking at a texture which will return an RGBA value. So I have to narrow this down to just look at one of the components. And it's all good again. And now I'll make myself a new, um, an offset um, for the position. And I say float my offset P equals, no, not float, sorry, back three. I need the full position is P. Because P is not something I can change. I have to assign P to my own uh, variable. And then I can say my offset P dot Z. Um, equals uh, offset L. So I have created here my own um, offset position and this I now need to pass into the TDD form function and then uh, towards the which is then passed to the GL position so let's take my offset um, position here and what I get is a quickly changing um, it's going to lower the frequency a little bit. Oh. Uh, a very flatly shaded uh, but offsetting grid.
So again, there's a, there's a couple other things in the default funk shader that we uh, don't necessarily require, which is, for example, um, you don't necessarily have to have a camera index if you only have one camera, but given that um, you output it from the funk shader, then all of these things are by default connect, uh, um, supported. Same with instance, coloring, etc. This is uh, not necessarily required now. Um, but the next step, what we would want to do is, we actually would like this to be uh, properly shaded and um, we would need to calculate the normals for this whole thing after transforming the position. So to calculate the normals, we need to give it the normals. Yeah? So then when you say that the offset dot C is equals to the other, oh, it's just because it, it, it used to be zero, right? Like the Z used to be zero and then the capital. Yeah, we give it exactly. The grid itself is just a plane, yeah. right? It's because they're not adding to it, but then it's, it's just zero. So. Yeah. Giving us Sorry. this kind of thing. So to do the normal shading now, or the, the shading of this whole uh, grid, we would have to uh, pass in the normals as a texture as well. And we can do this by um, adding as a new branch and adding new branches in touch, uh, middle mouse click on the output of the noise that you plug down first and find the uh, normal top, normal map top. and pass that into the shader, into the Fong shader as well. I'll call this sampler normal map and reference this null 2 to it. Is there no way to compute this in the shader? There probably is, but... Um, yeah, I mean, that, that definitely is, but since there is an operator, we'll take that. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, we've got that connected. And the next thing we need, we can apply or we can recalculate certainly the normals of this grid, but we also need uh, um, to do this kind of uh, mapping, we also need uh, tangents for the geometry because currently we also have texture coordinates and, um, and normals, but we also need to add uh, a tangent attribute to the whole thing. So let's add onto the grid, after the grid sub, let's add an attribute create sub. And enable compute tangents. Okay, and now let's grab the normal map in here in the vertex shader again by saying uh, the uniform sampler 2D normal map. Okay. And we can fetch those uh, normals by um, defining a vector three and we'll call it normal text equals texture um, normal map 
comma uv0 dot st dot rgb. So I said that we needed the tangents, the tangents attribute. And um, by default, we get attributes like the positional value here or the texture coordinates. But something that's not available by default to us is, for example, the tangents. So we have to get in the tangents here outside the main loop. So we can get attributes that we define. And those can also be custom attributes that we define by in um, that's a vec. Uh, four. That's a vec four. Thank you. The tangents. The tangents, yeah, because it also has the. Is it called the handiness? Handiness. 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 Oh, the, so it's, it's, it's the. the okay, yeah. When you create your. So in vec four T capital T. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to convert the, um, we basically need to convert the, uh, space. the space from uh, tangent into um, world object space or world space. The conversion, the TBN uh, that's from, Into okay, and luckily to do this, Malcolm added a function for us in very recently, where we uh, um, can convert this uh, the tangents into this TBN matrix, which will be required in the pixel shader stage to uh, recalculate the normals, and you can define matrices in Touch Designer as well. So let's do a mat3, oh, and we'll call it tbn mat equals, and now the function is td create tbn matrix. And what this tbn matrix requires is normals as the first um, value to this function. Then the tangent, uh, the first three parts of the tangent vector, T, X, Y, Z. And as the third argument to this function requires the handiness. So T dot W. Is the oh yeah X Y Z yeah X Y Z that's how the how the swivels work yeah that's by default the uh, like the GLSL convention because you have X Y Z I guess and then yeah. they add there is no nothing <laughs> else to go to. Okay, and this TBN matrix we need to send over to the pixel shader, which we can do with the struct that we earlier set, we um, that was defined. There's the vvert struct, uh, struct, and so in here, we'll also add a mat three, 
and we'll call it TBN. Uh, I already used Matt. Well, just let's call it TBN. Matt, sure. And in our function call, actually, let's say not we don't declare it as a mat3, but we just say vvert.tbnmat, which means that now we are declaring this uh, part, this variable that's part of the uh, structure, which is already declared here, so we don't need to declare it again. Uh, can you Sorry? Uh, yes, uh, there was added. I mean, it's in the it's in the latest official. <laughs> oh, it's you don't have the latest official. Uh, yeah, um, there is. Uh, <laughs> Let me give you the. Uh, um, da -dum. So what you can do also, it's basically it was a convenience function. So what you can do is you can uh, calculate the bitangent here with this function. take the cross product from the normals and the um, x, y, z um, components of the tangent vector times the handiness. But that's not the shade of the work. No, I'm sorry, I'm showing if, you, if you're not on the latest official build, so the, uh, uh, um, this, Sorry? I didn't catch the uh uh And then you can build up the um, TBN matrix yourself. It has the component vectors for, again, the uh, uh, tangent x, y, z. Then the bitangent and then the normals. Uh, this is a different shader. It's just uh, the uh, um, the TBN, the TD TBN matrix function that we just added was something that has been added uh, uh, in the latest official. So if you don't have the latest official, sorry. Uh, yeah, if this is. And we should be done with this, yes. What, what did you add for the for the A mat three uh, TBN mat. And the whole thing is erroring again because the uh, um, because there's a mismatch in the structure that we're sending across. So currently we defined a new uh, matrix in the vertex shader, in the out portion, and now the in portion gets something that is not, or the pixel shader receives something that it's uh, not expecting. So we have to go to the pixel shader here, uh, which we haven't opened yet. Uh, sorry, it's me again. Yeah. Um, it says TBN is not part and actually isn't part of the 
vertex Right, you have to, uh, sorry, um, I called it, I called it a mat3 TBN mat, and here it was called, is a, a mat3 TBN. Ah. It's basically just a variable name. So I'm I'm in the I'm in the I'm in the shader currently for everybody who's not updated to the latest official, uh, and I'll switch back to the shader, which is in the latest official. Yeah. Okay, so now I have this uh, cross function thing going on, and it just says like uh, in the competent types assignment of the competent types. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'll, uh, while Malcolm helps you, I'll um, look again at the error that I'm getting here, which is that there is a vertex mismatch between the uh, shader stages. And uh, as I said, we defined something in the out structure here, but we haven't defined it in the in structure on the pixel shader side. So let's open up the pixel shader. And by default, you have your t uh, pixel shader attributes here, uh, the uniforms that are coming in, the colors um, from S by the uh, parameters of the phone mat. And now here we'll have to declare the mat3 in the instructure TBN mat. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, if you didn't get the mismatch, then uh, did you define, are you sending over the, um, sorry, let me just close some stuff here. The TBN only defined in my outs on my vertex, it's not on my pixel. As a mat3? As a yeah, mat three. and you're not getting, and you saved it? No mismatch. Uh, Malcolm? Oh, yeah, thanks. Pixel shader, TBN mat. Uh, yet made. Uh, the because it, it's the, if you if we miss something, it's very difficult to now to, to forward it. Yeah, the, the pixel shader is already there. Um, it's already prepared for you when we uh, um, created it from the phone mat. Yes, but now when, when we change, it's very difficult to follow, uh, to, to wake up each thing because you change every, every, every time. So oh, sorry. Okay. To, uh, um, so I'm in the. Uh, I went to the pixel shader. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. And in the invert text defined uh, TBN yes, yes. method. Can you please recall the vertex shader again? Yes. Okay, I went to the vertex shader. <laughs> which where which part did you get uh
So the last step in this example here is now that we need to, we have this uh, TBN matrix where we can recalculate our normals with in the pixel shader to have the correct um, shading uh, depending on the lights, depending on the normal map that's incoming here. <clears throat> No, we still have to, we only created this uh, matrix that we can use to now recalculate the normals in the, uh, in the pixel shader stage. Be sorry, yeah? The second uh, question was, uh, the displacement is now only on the set axis, but not uh, on the orientation. So for example, if it's a sphere, the sphere only gets distorted in one direction, not, for example, from the, surf, uh, from the normals of the individual you would have to, correct, yeah, you would have to, um, uh, since the normal is a, is a three-part three, three vector then as well, you could um, bring in the noise and multiply it by the uh, direction of the normal, so by the normal. Um, on a plane surface, that's correct. Um, uh, duh, 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 duh. This shouldn't be too complicated. <coughs> if we go on the vertex stage, well, basically, we have the normals defined as n already in the shader. So now we can say that my offset p is p and is offset val times n. That's what I would have thought. Now pointing forward, um, let me just see. There's a one. Um, No, it's not just uh, times normal. It's the, uh, it's uh, plus equals. You want to take the, you want to take your uh, p, with, which is the position of your vertexy vertice, and you want to add the offset value times the normal for that vector displacement. Vector displacement, yeah. I had a, I just had an equals there before which obviously in x, y just squished it together to nothing because the normals are zero there. Does that work yes, thank you. for you? No problem. Okay, um, so uh, what we... In the vertex shader. In the vertex shader, yeah. So when you define the TD create TBN matrix, yes. it's called vvert.tbn mat. Yes. And then in the out vertex structure, it should say mat3 TBN mat. Yes, I have that. And. function. Um, Maybe it's not the last. Uh, 
the, the function uh, to be unmarked because I've, uh, I've lost the To follow, right? Okay. Okay. So I think we we all have we are all at this point here. So let's switch to the pixel shader again, where we defined the TBN mat as an incoming uh, mat three here in the vertex shader struct. And to recalculate the normals, we need the normal map that we had defined earlier as a texture to the as a, a texture sampler to the uh, uh, GLSL mat. So let's bring it in as a uniform here. as a uniform sampler 2D. And I had called this normal map. Okay. And we'll try to get to the We'll try to get to this uh, normal map via the uh, texture coordinates. Now, the funny thing is that uh, we actually don't have any texture coordinates being passed in here right now at the current point. So we will have to set that up in the vertex shader as we did before in the first example here. Haven't these gone unchanged? Sorry? Haven't these gone unchanged? Um, th yeah, we didn't, we didn't define... Um, they didn't come in through the phone mat though because so what happened is when you when you output the shader from the phone mat and you don't have a sampler a color map or something defined then it cuts cuts out that part so i'm going to switch back to the gl glsl vertex shader and we'll just have to create this um vec2 uh, for the texture coordinates So in the out vertex structure, define the vec2 text chords. Uh, so you can ask a question about the declaration of the structure, the yeah. structure. So the, isn't the vword there, like, what's the, what's the, its function? Is it the name? Yeah, it's the name, right? That's the name, correct. But why do you have then the, 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 the declaration of something like a type? Because it's the structure? Well, the structure can carry multiple types, so you can send stuff across that has various types. So vertex is basically the type of the structure? Uh, no, vertex is the... Uh, that's a good point, actually. In vertex... In, no, it's out vertex. Vertex is the, um, the name that it can be referenced in on the other side, so while right. vvert is your internal uh, variable name. It's, it, it, it's, it's important to say vertex because if you use geometry shaders, you can assign variable to going to the vertex shader, to the pixel shader, or not to the vertex because the first one, but you can choose to send a variable to the pixel shader or to the geometry shaders. Um, for the uh, for the uh, offset value, so that he can use any geometry. Uh, no, I just I don't I don't get lighting. I see it as flat. Uh, you see it as flat. Yeah, we're not we're. Um, I have to define the texture coordinates okay. in the vertex shader, 
because I hadn't, I hadn't defined a color map on the Fong when we initially output the shader. And by not defining the color map, um, it doesn't actually create the uh, texture coordinates as a part of the vvert uh, structure that's being sent over. So we have to do that first now. Um, and this was the uh, VEC2 that I defined text chords. And then let's do vvert uh, text chords equals, and that's the uh, UV zero dot st and once you have that you get an error again because you have to find you have to define those uh, texture coordinates on the incoming side of the pixel shader again so here on the pixel shader um, it will be back to text chords And we've got these texture coordinates here, which means now we can actually fetch from the normal map sampler that we had earlier declared. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, in the vertex or in the pixel shader? UV zero because of the ability of having multiple texture coordinates assigned to a geometry. And then the parts ST. Okay. And in the pixel, on the pixel shader side, on the instruct, back to text chords. And since we want to recalculate these normals here, maybe we'll start adding stuff in be uh, before the VEC3 on the pixel shader side before the VEC3 normal call here, the declaration will read in the normal map values from the uniform sampler to the normal map here. So normal map val, and we have to define what that is. Um, we'll take this as a VEC3 normal map val equals texture um, normal map comma get the uh, texture coordinates from the, the vvert structure and this would return a four part vector because rgba but we only defined it as a three part so you would have to add the swivels RGB to it. And we get our normal map read in. Now the normal map comes in as a, with a value range between zero and one. And what we need to do though is um, as they could point or as that could point into different um, directions, we need to normalize that to a value range from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1. Um, so let's do that. And this would be uh, just reassigning normal map val equals um, normal map val um, times 2 sorry, two times normal map val and then minus 0 0.5. Okay. 
the brackets now, I guess. Minus one. Minus one. If you do the minus two times after the multiplication should be minus one, or if you do before the multiplication, the multiplication. I need to yes. Thank you. And we now can multiply those normal values that we're reading from the texture with that uh, TBN mat uh, matrices that we, we brought in from earlier. So normal map val equals the normal map val times vvert dot TBN mat. Oh, sorry, and we need to do this. That's important which direction that goes. It's actually the TBN mat times the normal map valve. Sorry about that. Uh, it's not important this way, no? Shouldn't? Is it the uh, is the direct the uh, often it's important um, if the matrix is left multiplied or right multiplied? Yeah. So yeah. So the um, GLSL is the standard where you multiply your vectors on the one, right? So the column vectors. You can right. So most languages wouldn't allow you to that. But GLSL, if you do it the other way, you multiply by the transpose. And the normals that we have now uh, need to be basically normalized into uh, unit vectors with the uh, norm fun normalized function from GLSL so that they all have the uh, length of one, size of one. So my normal map val equals normalize normal map val. Okay. <clears throat> and now these, what was previously here, the normal, which is then being used further down in the lighting call of this shader that already has been created for us. We have to replace this normalized VBIRT world space normals, which came in previously via the world space with our own just recreated normal map valve. So the VEC3 normal, let's change that to VEC3 normal equals normal map valve. Oh, thank you. And what you get is basically now a properly, I should move the camera obviously. Um, what you're getting now is a properly normalized or properly shaded uh, deformed grid. So we jumped a bit back and forth, but just to repeat the, um, the four steps that we literally took here was that we offset, we offset each vertex by the amount of the noise top coming in. And we added the thing that we can have uh, multiplying the offset by the initial normals of the geometry. Then we created this um, tangent transform matrix with the TD create um, TBN matrix function call and sent the result over to the pixel shader stage. And on the pixel shader stage, we read in the normal map. 
then rearrange the normal map values from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1, multiplied this with the TBN matrix, or more, again, have the ma matrix on the left side, the uh, normal values on the right side, to transform it from the uh, tangent space into the um, other space. <laughs> Finally, normalize this and pass it on into the um, lighting call that's further down in the shader. So the um, it, it's not too many steps, essentially. You can get there fairly easily. Uh, we did a little bit of jumping around by uh, adding texture coordinates and such, but uh, it's not too difficult. You can simplify the shader a little bit as well. Uh, the normal map uh, top, the normal map, map top has the option to uh, um, add the height map in the alpha channel. What this means is that um, we could just read in one sampler and read the offset value of the alpha channel of that sampler instead of passing in the noise and the normal map separately, you could just have those two combined as one. So for the next, for the next portion of uh, this workshop, or for the remaining time, I think what I'll do is uh, we'll go into instancing, and I'll show you how to use instance geometry inside of a shader. Uh, this is in part by... Um, since instancing is such a huge part of Touch Designer, it's really important to know how that works in shaders. The, uh, um, the project files that were on the, uh, on the drive that I handed out or that you downloaded uh, kind of extend that whole example to uh, um, also show how to build a little uh, particle system out of the whole thing. Um, We'll see how far we get, but I also would like to give you an example of how to take a shader toy example and convert that into Touch Designer because that's also very interesting. So I might skip the particle system part just to get just to get through. But it's on the it's on the files that I have uh, handed out, and the um, I mean I can just share the instructions as well, so that you then uh, can recreate that. Which so uh, the files that I handed out, um, it's called simple, simple particle system, I think. There's, uh, yeah, simple particle system underscore one, two, three. Um, those are the three parts of that file, uh, which will um, just uh, probably will do the first part and then. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna collapse my network again to push it into a separate thing so that it's not interfering with anything that I will build now. Uh, select all of that, collapse, select it, and call this uh, displace shader, 3D displace. Doesn't really matter what it's called, but that's fine. Um, the first step would be that um, on the drive that I shared with you or in the Dropbox, there's a little TOX file which is called um, Connect Texture 1280 by 720. And please drag that into your um, network. All that is, it's basically, it's two images in there that I locked from output from the Kinect. The first output here is the, uh, um, is the Kinect point cloud as it comes in from the Kinect camera. Uh, so the point cloud here is saved. Um, all the X values of each pixel are saved in the red channel. The uh, Y values are saved in the green channel and the depths are saved in the blue channel. And the second image here is the uh, color map from the Kinect. 
And our task will be to take this color map, at uh, the depth map, create um, with instances, create a geometry out of that, or not a geometry, but uh, instance particles in space. And um, as the last, then apply a color map to it. So let's start by adding, do you all have the connect texture 1280 by 720? Uh, so let's add a couple null tops on the output of it. So two nulls so that we can always see the uh, um, the two different outputs from the Kinect camera here. And since we will we'll see every point that the Kinect point cloud gives us will render as a particle as well and to render particles that you instance you can create a simple particle system by using an add sub and the add sub lets you create multiple points essentially we just need one point in the center and then on the polygons page we'll have to convert this one point into uh, so that it's recognized as a primitive and um, polygon. So on the polygons page, uh, put star into the polygon field and then turn closed on. And now use a convert sub. And convert this whole thing to particles. And the particle type. Marcus. Yeah. No problem. Uh, I have um, an error. In valid phase specification, only uh, adding up. So just if you get a warning, make sure that on the points page you have this checkbox turned on to create at least one point. So we have, we have created a little particle system now with exactly one particle. All you need for happiness, uh, apparently. Um, and we'll set up a render network now. So at uh, geometry comp. I always do this way. Um, for some people create the geometry inside the geometry component. I just create usually the geometry outside and then add a geo comp uh, to it just to keep it simpler. And we'll again take a camera and we'll use the, uh, um, oh actually, no, don't take a camera, delete the camera and from the palette, wrong button, from the palette grab under tools the arcball camera. Arcball camera, yeah. So the arcball camera comes as a little component which is basically um, a control, an interface, control interface that you can rotate by mouse, rotate the, uh, the cube in. And uh, if you go inside that arcball camera, so it comes as a full example, but all we are interested in is actually this cam one inside of it. And this will allow us to rotate around this whole thing that we're setting up. So inside arcball camera, just copy cam one and go a level up. And we can delete the arcball camera and place the cam one. 
and now add a render top. And add an out top to this render. Okay. Sorry? The Arcball camera or? So I, I dragged in the Arcball camera and then went inside the Arcball camera. And copied the cam one component. And then pasted it outside of the Arcball camera and removed Arcball camera. Um, so the Arcball camera, or uh, this camera here, um, if, you, if you look at the parameters, you see it has a custom, a custom parameter page, which lets you define um, which panel component it should look at to enable the interactive uh, tumbling and uh, panning of the... Yeah, all these, yeah, exactly. And it's, if you look inside of that, you will see that there's just a bunch of um, text stats mainly, and it outputs, it comes back with a matrix which is used in the, uh, um, on the view page. Not on the view page, on the transform, pre-transform page to change the transform of the camera. Um, th so this camera, basically, you need to put that inside a container, and since we're inside project one, it will be referencing that. Okay, and let's also take a, mater a phone material here and reference that to the geo. And we'll, we won't do the same mistake again. Last time we had to uh, manually create or define, not define, manually declare the uh, texture coordinates and everything. Let's just do that by default here by dragging the color map onto the color map parameter of the Fong mat. And then hit output shader. And we'll again reference the Fong 1GLSL on the material page of the uh, uh, GO1 component. And I'll delete the Fong. Yeah. So the next step, what we should do is maybe um, let's remove any lighting because for this example we literally we don't need any lighting we'll have uh, a flat shaded uh, point cloud it's going to be shaded with the color from the camera itself from the color map it's like a point, uh, point sprite uh, application for every vertex right yeah, yeah. exactly so in the uh, vertex let's open up the vertex shader and what we have here is we have, uh, if you look at all these things here, diffuse color, ambient color, speckler, shininess, shadow strengths, all of that can go. I'll delete it. And we just need a diffuse, right? We don't even need a diffuse. Save that. And now open up the pixel shader. I'm just going to close a couple other shaders here. Let's open up the pixel shader as well. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. We delete all the uniforms. All the uniforms, yeah. All the uniforms are gone, but we'll keep the vertex structure here. Also the 
the uh, uh, we need we need yeah in the vertex shader we remove all the uniforms, yes. but in the pixel shader we keep the color map. So when you when you now switch to the um, pixel shader, remove all the diffuse, ambient, specular color, shininess, shadow strengths, and shadow color. But yes, keep the color map. And looking further through this uh, pixel shader here, we can also remove a lot of these functions. We have diffuse sum and specular sum, something we don't need. We don't need any normal calculation in here. So we can remove this as well. Diffuse sum, specular sum, and normal. Delete that. Yeah, yeah, that's expected. Okay. The next place is this whole uh, loop here that steps through every light that's used in uh, for this scene, potentially. This whole loop can be removed as well. We can remove all these uh, diffuse contributions, final specular, out color RGB is gone. Out color times equals color map color is gone. We can remove the fog, the alpha calculation. Don't need dithering. Don't need alpha tests. Basically everything. Marcus, yes. I was suggesting like the fog and the alpha tests and the dither. Oh, okay. Okay, that's a very fair point. So we'll um, we'll remove everything except for the uh, um, TD alpha test and the um, dithering. So we'll we'll redefine alpha ourselves here. Dut, 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 dut to diffuse them. Um, you will get an alpha, uh, an error now because alpha is not defined. So let's just define an alpha here. Float alpha equals one and save that and this should get rid of all errors. You still, uh, you should be getting um, as before like a should look very black, black and bleak. Okay, I already mentioned that we currently have a particle system with one single particle. And what we want to do is we want to actually instance this one particle as many times as we have points in our point um, cloud from the connect. No, I removed it all. I removed that as well. And I did, I did, yeah, because we, um, as Malcolm said, when we keep the dithering and the uh, uh, alpha test, then you already have it in place in case you need it later on. So it's good to keep that as a, and then because alpha was defined earlier, but I removed it, I added float alpha and set it to one. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to create, um, if you want to create now the amount of uh, instances as we have points in our um, point cloud image here, first we need the resolution of that image, and you get to this resolution by using an info chop, pretty easily. So let's place down an info chop, 
and the info job expects an operator, which will be our um, the image with the point cloud in it. And now the uh, info job has a scope parameter, and in the scope parameter, we'll just we just want to pull out the channels res x and res y. Now, to get the total number of pixels, add a math chop and multiply the two channels. Math, combine channels, multiply. Just going to move some stuff a little bit around here, give myself a little space. And I'll add a null at the end of it. And now we'll use this number to create instances of our single particle. So select the geometry component. And on the instance page, turn on instancing. And then there's this parameter instance count. And on the instance count, we can either get the lengths by, um, as probably many of you have done before, by getting the length of the channel. So you can have like 100 samples in the channel and that will create 100 instances. But we just have one number and we want that number to be the determinator here. So we'll change the instant count to manual and then export from that null three, that is the total number of pixels by activating the viewer active flag and exporting onto the num instances parameter. Okay. So we now have created about uh, 900,000 uh, particles to which we have access in the vertex shader and in the, uh, yeah, in the vertex shader. Now we need to offset those uh, particles by the value given by the point cloud. But currently the point cloud image here is not actually used as an input in our uh, Fong GLSL material. So select the, the GLSL mat called Fong 1 GLSL and on the samplers page add something that we can call um, as point cloud. And this is perhaps a standard that I don't adhere to um, often enough. Uh, the naming of your variables that you're passing into the shader, like the uh, samplers, if you prefix this, prefix this with a little s, then you know, oh, that's a sampler that I've defined outside. If you take uniforms, um, put a little u on it in front, then you know where they're coming from. So it's, then it's better for readability, definitely. Um, and this S point cloud sampler name that we have created here, the reference top for that is the null one for me, uh, should be probably null one for everybody with the uh, RGB point cloud from the connect. Okay. Our next, uh, our next task in this will be to uh, figure out which instance we are currently working on. Like what's the, uh, what's the particle that's currently being worked on in the vertex shader and then fetch the correct pixel from the point cloud image and uh, apply it to the position of this particle. So let's edit the vertex shader here again. I'm switching to the vertex shader. And we do have our P position attribute, which will adjust. But first again, let's try to figure out if you wanna know which instance is currently worked on, it's, um, it's passed into, uh, um, 
it's passed into Touch Designer and is called, uh, is it the GL instance ID? No, it was renamed. It's the TN, TD instance ID, TD instance ID. So uh, previously we had GL instance ID, but uh, instances are worked on in batches as well, Malcolm, right? Okay, so for this we'll use TD instance ID, which gives us a pre uh, a number where we don't have to jump through different hoops to actually get to the instance. Um, and this is an integer, so let's define that as an int instance equals TD instance ID. Okay. Now, how do we get to the correct pixel? that we need to work on. To, uh, to get to this, uh, we would need the resolution of, the, um, of that sampler. And that resolution is um, given to us. No, that resolution has to be passed into by um, a uniform that we define. So let's go on the GLSL mat to the vectors page. And let's create a uniform called U-Res, for example. And the two values for this U-Res should be the resolution, uh, the channels that uh, we grabbed with the info shop here. So I'm just going to make a new branch by middle mouse clicking on the output. <coughs> and export res x, res y onto the uh, u-res parameter. <coughs> export and export. Exporting again, we did that with the uh, activate the uh, viewer flag and then drag the channels onto those two parameters. Now in the pixel shade, in the vertex shader here, we can grab that uniform by uh, defining it as a uniform vec2 u-res and now my vec2 cur pixel I'll just store it both into a, a vec2 type um, and I'll set that to zero uh, for start. Whoops, back two, obviously. And now I'll figure out which pixel it is in a row by saying curl pixel dot x equals. Um, and this is TD uh, is instance modulated by the uh, uh, X resolution. <coughs> so that's U-res dot X. <coughs> and my cur pixel dot Y, so I know which, sorry, so we, we we now know which column it is, curpixel.x. And now for my curpixel.y, I'll do instance <coughs> divided by uRes.y. Uh, x. You, you, make, uh, you put modulo uRes in the, in the x? Is yeah. The one, or is the it's uh, instance modulo u-res.x. 
and then instance divided by us.x. So this should be floats. And the, uh, the second one, the us.y, definitely needs to, we need to uh, uh, floor that or use int to get to the actual row number. Because when you initialize them in the beginning, the current pixel, you initialize them with a float, which was... Which is fine, yeah. We just need the, um, it's, a, it's a vec2, so uh, a float for that. And only for, for the, uh, uh, since it's a modulo, it will give us... But for the row number, we need to put the int around it. <clears throat> Which gives us an error. Let's check that. Oh, the us.x needs to be uh, uh, an integer itself. Yes. Ivec2. Ah, that's clever. That saves us some brackets. Yes, always. <laughs> 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 very nice that here I don't have to walk to him. He's right there. <laughs> um, we'll use it. Currently, we have the pixel as an integer number. Um, but if we want to now use that to look into a texture, we'll have to divide it by the resolution, making it a float again. So that's the idea for this. Um, so yeah, our next step would be to divide the curved pixel by the resolution, because curve pixel currently gives us a literal uh, row column number, but we need to have um, uh, a UV kind of scale, zero to one kind of scale. So, so you can't use not some of the UV that we have already assigned by touch. Uh, no, we don't have UVs because we just have a single a single particle. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing there. Um, each each in uh, each instance, if it would have UV, would have its own um, separate Basically UV no system. Way. Yes. So curve pixel um, divide equals Qres. Now, one thing that happens as well is that the um, what we're now having is, if you look at the first pixel that we're working on, um, what's happening here is that we are looking at the border of the first pixel because we take uh, zero, the f first pixel is zero zero, and um, so our UV would be zero zero, looking at the edge of the pixel which is not necessarily something you want to do because that edge is kind of a not well-defined point. You're in between pixels. So we should be adding half a pixel to this whole thing, uh, offset this UV by half a pixel. And this we can do by saying curl pixel plus equals one. So we have to calculate the size of one pixel, which is one divided by u res and we'll put brackets around it this is one pixel we are offsetting by one pixel now but if we divide this by two we're now looking at the center of every pixel Goes back to yeah. And we previously have defined the point cloud in the 
um, as a sampler. So we should be bringing this in as a uniform into the vertex shader here. So let's do that. Uh, uniform sampler 2D uh, as point cloud. And now we can say vec3 my point pos is um, texture because we're going to look into that sampler as point cloud comma curve pixel and instead of the p i mean the position of all these particles is zero anyway we don't really need that p we can just replace the p in the tdd form function with the my point pos and we get an error <clears throat> oh casting yes yeah that's because i use the texture um, which returns again RGBA and it should be RGB since we are just interested in the three positional arguments that are saved in there. This is actually a good place where you probably don't want to use RGB, but because you're just grabbing position from it, you could use XYZ here. Readability again. So when you use the ST? That's in the UV uh, for texture coordinates. I mean, ST. I wouldn't be able to tell you. Yeah. I don't know about But it's a it's a good question as well, Malcolm. I never I never asked that. Um, we use you we use usually we say UV coordinates. But in GLSL, it's dot .s dot .t. Why is it not dot .u dot .v? Well, it's just it's what GLSL decided on the language. And they, did, they did that because they have x, y, z, w. So the w's are in the oh, U, v. position. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's OK. Perfect. So it's with GLSL. Yeah. So the next step, the next step would be we have the point position, and it's a little bit difficult to see that here because it's all black. Um, but what we already have defined in our output structure is the vvert.color, which is basically the uh, probably we could best describe it as the uh, well, it's the vertex color of that point of that particle. So we just use that we. Um, We'll just use this vvert.color and look into the color texture with the same current pixel uh, coordinates. vvert.color equals texture. Obviously, we have to, sorry, I forgot to define that texture up here as an incoming uniform. So we should do that first uniform sampler to the uh, S color map. And then again, once we have that, get the color from it uh, as color map, comma, curve pixel. And since this vvert.color is a vec4, now we have to write uh, it's both vec4. By deleting everything previously in the shader, in the pixel shader, what has happened is that we have this VEC4 color there. We'll switch over there in a second. And VEC4 color was set to a zero, like to a null vector. Uh, and uh, now we have to use the, uh, um, the vvert.color and assign that to this uh, color vector 
that is currently defined as black inside the pixel shader. So once everybody uh, looks like we're ready, so let's go to the pixel shader. And the color here, if you look down, it's called, uh, it's called out call. So let's do that right under here. We'll go under the VEC4 out call and say out call equals revert dot color. And everybody should see something like this. I honestly, um, perhaps you have to change your preference. Oh, sorry, the black background. Yes, of course. Um, the black background for me, I just switched that back. Uh, what probably most of you see is uh, this, maybe, with the checkerboard. Sure. Yeah, I'm trying to understand why that is. Second, I just want to. Right. So, so for changing the position, we have to change the camera, right? And that's why we brought in this arc ball camera. Yeah. This is like the point where we set the, the parts of the Yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. The which one? Sorry. Uh, no. No, it goes straight. The. Uh, um, yeah. 
you can already uh, you can you can toggle around the view by opening up the viewer for your for the network that you're working in um, as we added the arcball camera to it now uh, there would be one more change here to do which is on the uh, um, we would have to set currently in the viewer of your um, container that you're working in you can only um, tumble your view you cannot use the right mouse button or the middle mouse button um, and you can change that by right clicking into the network and opening up the parent parameters so those are the parameters for project one and just turn on the middle and right mouse UV buttons on the panel page so uh, you can um, I'm not sure it will be aligned because you have to use the connect align. Yeah, it, it won't probably won't be aligned. Yeah, um, but. Uh, I'm just curious. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but, uh, so this is going to be a Well, because you want it, you want us to see it like this. Well, well, because the alpha ends up because we end up ignoring that alpha. That yeah. you get this alpha so gets ignored. Wouldn't be enough just a back tree to to give color to the point cloud? No? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you may because not because we don't need the alpha. Yeah, it's quite possible. Yeah, you don't necessarily need it for sure. Yeah, yeah why isn't that working? Um, 
I know. There you go. Yeah. Where was that? So there's another line. So further down in the shader, there was there's another spot where vvert.color was getting set, which was overriding where we were setting it up earlier. So we had to come out this line down here. It's in the vertex shader, yeah. In this particular case, yeah, pretty much the pixel shader is just passing the color through, and that's all. Yeah, it's not doing any actual shading yet. It's just passing the color through. Yeah, so in this case, yeah. But you, you always need a pixel shader, though. Yeah, you always need something. So, so you, need, you still need to do some, some sort of work. Yeah. Well, uh, like, sorry, just give me one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry? Um, okay, give, give me a second. Let me answer your question. This creates a lot of No, the only thing is that. Uh, it's kind of so well, well. So these are so. Did you did you try to run these? Like, did you go uh, run the screen? On these? Did you did you do that? No. Okay. What, what is this? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's. So they're trying to run this text as uh, these oh, files okay. in Python, which they're obviously not Python, which is why you see those errors, right? Uh, okay. So so um, just clear those errors. Yeah. What do you... Oh, sorry. Ah, no, no problem. Oh. But what do you tell me? Uh, the clear or what? Yeah, there's, there's a right... Uh, on the right click menu, there's a clear strip there. Ah, okay. Perfect. Thanks. Um, Malcolm, I have two cases with... Uh, where it's not rendering anything with just single points, but they also compared shaders and they have everything the same. Okay. Uh, it might be. A, this is an Intel card. This is a GTX 960. The uh, um, if you can just raise your hands for one point rendering, yeah. There and there. perfect. Um, so given the risk, yes. Kind of maybe the question. Yeah. So when we have the speed up, which is it's happening because of all the processing on the GPU, right? Yeah. So to get like the, the real speed up, we have to do if we make an effect. We have to never leave the GPU world, right? Because like every time you leave the GPU world, then you go to the old way of doing stuff, then you want to have a bottleneck, right? You want to do as much as you can on the GPU. Yeah, that's correct. Um, anything animating, uh, if you're trying to animate lots of things, if you can do it with instances, then that's perfect. Do it with instances. Um, uh, there's, if it's in general for ge uh, geometry animations or? Yeah, I guess. You know, we want to move in an interesting way, or all this, all the points that we move in an interesting way, or yeah, I guess mostly that, you know, kind of like animate the new in some kind of. Yeah, for the time being, I mean, you can get pretty far. 
with subs. I, I find you can push it quite a bit before you run to bottlenecks. But if you're looking at uh, hundreds of thousands, then there is no way around it okay. currently. And then the next thing is that okay. we did the, the video on the GPU on the, on the geometry shader, but then we still instance uh, all these one million polys with the, with the, with the geometry code instance. Isn't that slower than? No, we, we, only have, we, only have one, we only have one particle that we send to the GPU. The GPU is instancing and uh, we're offsetting then there. Okay. So just, uh, yeah, there we have the... Uh, yeah, we didn't use the instance on the joint call. Yeah. yeah. Uh, an absurd question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, theoretically, so if we have a, an equally triangular normal map, we are able to draw a full 3D object of the, from only taking the texture Without right. accessing uh, in a uh, real geometry, I'm thinking for, for example, to photogrammetry and so on. Uh, with photogrammetry, you have to reconstruct the 3D shape uh, yeah. uh, via photo. But if we should able to create a normal map via photo, we are able to create an object with, without using the mesh. Um, more or less. More or less, you don't have you don't have uh, connections between the points. It would just be single points, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. You don't have a mesh that need normal map because you yeah. just have the points. No, no, no. Okay, okay, but the you, have, you, have way, you have a way. You have a way to scale right. uh, the polygon level. Yeah. Only using, uh, for example, like in this case, uh, the the number of points. And applying the displacement. Oh right, yeah. Using the normal map. Uh, sure. So we have yeah. no geometry, but we have the top topology of the 3D object only using a texture. So you would send in a grid, basically. Yeah. 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 Right. A static grid, and then offset it with. Yeah. 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 yeah you could do that definitely. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I want you know, to try this. But you do. I mean, it's just. Um, there's one thing about optimization here which should be mentioned. Uh, currently we're sending in um, one particle and we're instancing it uh, 900,000 times. This uh, can be scaled up to uh, whatever, an HD image or uh, things. Eventually you, you, might, you will run into performance problems with instancing as well. Um, just one second. So the uh, so what what you can do in this case is uh, you could you could just take multiple particles. Like if you have two particles, you only have to instance half as many times those two particles. Uh, and so the scales you have a little bit more leeway there to scale higher. Um, all you have to change here in um, in the vertex shader is. Um, the calculation for your current pixel. Currently, the current pixel is the instance modulated by the USX. What you want to do then is get the vertex ID, which is the uh, uh, which is GL underscore vertex ID, and uh, uh, that plus instance plus uh, yeah. So you take the GL vertex ID plus your TD instance ID and the TD instance ID multiplied with a uniform value that says how many particles per instance you're passing in. So by the number of cores on the GPU. <laughs> Sorry? Sure. By, I mean like, if you divide by, by the, the number GPU. of cores on the GPU, yeah. we get like, a, like a streams of particles in JQuery with the number of cores maybe, so we get maximum power power. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. on that. For instance, I don't know where the hit is. No, I don't know. Because when we looked at the performance pointer, uh, something which is switching to uh, graphics content, yeah. this is taken all the time. So what does this mean? Uh, that is any time when there is communication between the CPU and the GPU. 
when you're uploading or downloading data. Yeah. So um, the next thing I'll just show you, and you have this file. Uh, if you open up the uh, simple particle system three file. Da, da, da. Uh, yeah. Do you really need to an instance like why can't you create the vertex directly in the shader? A vertex like, you uh, would you can only you, uh, you can only do this in the geometry on the in the geometry um outside No in the geometry shader in the geometry shader. Yeah. But that's way too many points for a geometry shader. It's not fast <laughs> enough. It would be you would you would be bottlenecking very quickly with that. Yeah. It, you cannot create as many points on the geometry shader uh, stage. Okay. Um, so I just I'll just give you a quick walkthrough here. Um, this is basically um, the same thing, except. Uh, all these points that were there have been transformed via a little particle system. And the, uh, the transformation is happening in the, uh, um, where the, before the point cloud is given to this little render system. So your particle system is not built in the uh, GLSL material here. It's built in a 2D uh, GLSL top and what it's being done here I'll show you the pixel shader for this is that you define a uh, number of outputs a uh, number of buffers you need the position for your uh, for your particles and you need the velocity for your particles and this is for this simple example, where we just have position and velocity. And then you feed those into a feedback network, into a feedback um, top, so that you get the previous uh, iteration of this. You obtain the derivation of, uh, for each frame in this way, create a loop in uh, the feedback. Right? Yeah. yeah, you well, you get the previous position. Or, yeah. And the previous, uh, or and the velocity that you calculate, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you just add it. Um, then you add to the velocity. You add turbulence with a certain factor just to adjust how much is applied to it, and um, you add that velocity to the position, and you add a little bit of drag to the velocity so that it's uh, lowering over time, so that it's not static and you output the new point position and the velocity to the two buffers. Now, the, uh, the feedback point position here I used also and fed it into a noise component that you can find in the tools section of your uh, palette in, uh, in Touch Designer. And this is the shader that, um, I'm not sure actually, this is from Brian Sharp at .wordpress.com. And what he has, he has a number of different uh, noise functions. But the most important thing here is that it can give you the, uh, um, the slope between each noise point. And this is necessary in a 3D noise so that when the particles are moving through 3D noise, that you can apply the slope as turbulence onto the velocity to get a proper uh, turbulence movement. So we don't have that, uh, currently we don't have that function in our noise top. That's why this noise um, noise component that's in the palette under the tool section, under the generator section, sorry. Uh, generators, uh, noise, you can grab it from there. Um, now, we can just quickly reset this whole thing so you see what's happening. Uh, we have to reset those two uh, particle systems and then you can kind of follow what's happening here. It's being displaced in all different directions. 
by the velocity and the turbulence. And the velocity, the initial velocity is given through a UV map that uh, I rescaled to be uh, so that they, they drift apart basically all the points. So it was from 0 to 1 to minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.4. But uh, that's all in the. Uh, um, minus 0 0.4? That was. Uh, it's only okay. Whatever. Yeah. Just to uh, normalize it no, basically. The, yeah. The and, the, okay. and I multiplied that with a noise. Um, the noise top has this function where you can out where you can multiply the noise with the input, so I used that to kind of uh, make it a little bit irregular. Um, a full version of of this particle system here, um, and I wanted to mention that again is in the tools section under the GPU particles, uh, particles GPU. Now, if you download the experimental version of Touch Designer, um, or what's currently experimental, the, uh, uh, there's a slight change in this system from before. Uh, we're using here two modes to create particles. Until now, we had to create all the particles at once, because in a particle, in a, in a, um, you cannot keep count in a GLSL shader, in the official version. Since the official version we added in, or um, not, not all of us, but uh, derivative did add in the atomic counter functions for shaders, which gives you the uh, ability to actually count every, for every pixel operation that you do in the pixel shader, you can increment or decrement these counters. And this gives you the possibility to actually count how many uh, pixels you have worked on and in that case, you can count uh, how many particles have been born and abort operations or just pass through operations if enough particles have been created. Um, so, yeah, this is interesting to look at. And another thing that we won't cover now, because the last 10 minutes I want to convert this shader toy thing, um, is to have a look at, uh, yeah, inside this component here, at the geometry stage of the particle system. And where is it? Here we have the GLSL. So f what this system works exactly the same as the previous, that we have a single point that's being instanced, and then um, uh, we, add, we add a texture to it. But we're rotating every single we are rotating every single particle here. Now, this is not something you could theoretically do with a single particle. You cannot rotate that thing because it's just literally a point. And that's where the geometry stage comes in. So in, these, in the middle um, geometry uh, shader here, what this is doing is per uh, particle, it's creating four vertices. And there's a couple of rotation uh, functions here. And then you can see that for each, um, it creates a vertice at the left bottom. And then amidst this vertice, it creates one at left top, amidst it, right bottom, right top, and then amidst the whole primitive. So in this stage, in the geometry sh uh, stage, you see how it's creating four different vertices and then emitting them as a particle. And, uh, as a as a primitive, and with the uh, functions here, um, because there's rotate functions for each. Is it only in the experimental uh, version? No, the atomic the atomic okay. counters no, no, are, yeah, okay. and this one is also in the regular official version, okay. the geometry. Okay. Uh, it's just good to check out, and you can kind of uh, follow how it works with the geometry. Uh, a simple example of geometry um, shaders. In touch, uh, much more detailed stuff probably tomorrow at 11 a.m. when Stanislav is going to show his uh, GPU um, geometry shaders. Yes, They're definitely something not to miss if you're not in a workshop. Um, okay, so for the last 10 minutes, and luckily this should be fairly quick, I'm just going to close this down, quit, da da. I have this here. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to collapse again my whole thing into a component. Collapse selected into um, and call this connect point cloud. Um, more of these pixel operations, sorry, I have to mention that as well. Uh, there, there, are, there are more of these uh, GLSL shader things here uh, that render basically particles for uh, these color scopes that we added. It's the 3D scope, the histogram, as well as the um, waveform monitor. All of these actually use the same system um, of uh, taking taking particle uh, taking points vertices and placing them by looking at a different texture uh, as a transform input. Worthwhile checking those as well. Okay, so now let's have a look at this uh, in the same folder that I gave you. There is a shader toy example the GLSL. And you can just drag that in. It should create a text dot. It's an example by uh, Inigo Akile. Uh, uh, I'll work on that. Um, his, his examples on shader toy are very, uh, very, very useful. His website with techniques as well in general. And um, I copied this one. It, it's a Voronoi uh, example. And I would like to get this running inside uh, Touch Designer. <coughs> so the first thing for this to do would be, let's create a constant top. And set it to 1280 by 720 or something. It's not really that important for this. And create a GLSL top. And now instead of the default GLSL pixel shader that's coming here, uh, just use the text one dot that you just dragged in from the outside and replace the pixel shader parameter with it. So the pixel shader parameter of your GLSL top should now be uh, pointing to this one that um, we got of shader toy. And you should get a nice error. That's very expected. And the first thing to do is check the info dot. So place an info dot and drag the GLSL top on the operator parameter. And have a look what the errors are. So it's complaining about four different errors here. One is I channel zero, then I time. That's actually yeah twice. So I time. That's uh, the same error here, and then I resolution. Um, and um, so let's work on this. I channel zero, we can check actually what the definition is of all these uh, variables that are causing errors by going to shader toy. And um, I should have probably, but we can find it quickly. Dip, dip, dip. Although the internet is so badly. Oh no, that's. This is the one that I downloaded here. <clears throat> so if you're downloading from Shader Toy, then a good thing to check out is this uh, Shader Inputs. Um, the left side should be, I don't know why it's saying my WebGL hit a snack, but it doesn't matter. The left side is the output, which should be usually rendering, running. And then on the right side, you usually have the code, but also you have this list of um, 
values or variables here. And so the eye resolution tells you it's the viewport resolution in pixels. So we need that. It's our uh, texture resolution. Then eye time is playback time in seconds. So that's something we have to pass in as a uniform. And what was the other thing? Oh, and eye channel zero. Well, that's actually the, uh, those are the textures that are being passed into, um, into the shader. Uh, in this example, it's a noise. It's a random noise texture. So what we can do here, we can replace the constant one with a noise top. So let's create a noise top and set the type to random and choose the random GPU type so we can nicely animate it. And I'll change my resolution of this noise also to 1280 by 720. And then plug it into the first input. Yeah, yeah, noise type, random GPU. And now let's open up that shader. And right away at the top where it's creating um, there's a function called hash two. It has it has a return texture level of detail and then an i channel zero. Um, so the texture level of detail, I had to look that up. It's uh, and from what I read, it's usually only useful on um, for mip mapping purposes in the vertex shader stage. But we don't need that, right, Malcolm? It's Oh, so you can control actually the mipmap level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In a in a yeah. So in the mat, it would be uh, can be important. Um, in the GLSL top, we don't need that. And to get rid of to get rid of the whole thing, it is a. Um, it does have an extra attribute at the end of the texture, a third, um, a third part of the uh, texture call, which is here the 0.0, .0 so we can remove that as well. <clears throat> and then replace the I channel zero by our um, S, and that's from all the start, from the very start of our class, STD inputs, uh, zero std 2d thank you 2d input zero okay first thing on so let's create an i time i time we don't we know that this is a play time in seconds so we'll define this as a uniform here i time And then we'll pass in time in seconds, which uh, if we just want to be really quick, we'll use a um, Python function apps time dot seconds. And then in the shader, we have to bring this in as a uniform. So uniform float i time. When we have that, what's left is the i resolution line here. Everybody should have approximately the same. And let's try to find I resolution. 
So here, high resolution brings actually something else. Uh, we uh, suddenly see something else that's unfamiliar. We have uh, a function that's called void main image. We're mostly used to void main. So let's fix that. <laughs> let's kill the image part. And then the other thing is that we have out back four frag color and in back two frag chord defined inside this function call. Um, it's also something we uh, previously have seen how this is defined outside of that main function. So out back four frag color and the in back four frag color we don't frag chord we don't need. We need to figure out what frag chord actually is. And for frag chord, I had to Google a little bit before I found it, uh, what it means. Um, the, the uh, yeah, it's, it's not the UOV, it's the UV as integer yeah, pixel. UV, uh, yeah. yeah, so. Uh, it's the coordinate uh, where you, if I don't remember wrong, is the coordinate where you touch the text. Or... Yeah, as integers, yeah. yeah. Uh, looking at the center of the pixel, yeah. yeah. So, um, divided, by two, by divided by the resolution here, which is basically our um, UV, our own uh, UVs that we get from Touch Designer. So this VEC2P, which is the integer pixel uh, position divided by the resolution, is actually our VUV. So we can replace this whole thing here. Track port divided by a resolution dot with v u v dot s t control s and we'll remove this and you should have the same shader now running in touch designer if you don't have errors. If you have errors, what would be the errors? Let me know. <laughs> 